If you're familiar with the passage in Ephesians 6, you'll notice that there are different elements of the armor of God. And today I want to explain to you, um, you know, why they are, well, why I believe they are what they are and what they represent uh, in the Christian life. So the armor of God. 1 Timothy 6, we'll just start here, says here, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many. So we see here in 1 Timothy, because we've got 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, these are letters from Paul to Timothy, who was a bishop in the New Testament. So he's saying here that there's a fight to be fought, right? Fight the good fight of faith. I mean, you've probably heard people saying that a lot, right? It's a, it's a saying that people say a lot when they're talking about fighting the good fight. Uh, whether it's the good fight of faith or whether it's fighting some other fight, they say fight the good fight because we are in a fight. We are in a spiritual fight. Now, when you're in a fight, you can't afford to be not aware that you're even in a fight because there are three types of Christians in the world, and I know um, this sort of analogy has been used in other areas of life as well. But there's three types of Christians in this fight, this spiritual war that we find ourselves in. Number one is there are the Christians that are actually fighting, that they're in the fight, they're on the front lines, they're on the battlegrounds doing the work, trying to preach the gospel, trying to get the word of God out there. Then you have another type of Christian that is just watching the fight, the spectator, right? They can see that everyone's doing, you know, other Christians are doing the fight and they're just watching, supporting, but not actually in the fight themselves. Right? And then you have the third type of Christian that is sleeping. Right? They don't even realize there is a fight that's going on. Right? And, and that doesn't mean they're doing nothing. That just means you know, they may be busy with life, busy with work, busy with career, busy with the riches and the pleasures of this life. But they're spiritually asleep. Meaning they're not awake to the fact that there is a war on for the souls of mankind and we need to get the gospel out there. You know, and it's it's a very important fight, right? So wake up. Wake up to the fight that is on. You know, put on your spiritual glasses. Realize life is not just about living in the here and now. Right? Life is not just about making a comfortable life for yourself, you know, and just living it up nice and comfortable in this world. That's not what life is about, right? And if you live that way, you will waste your life. Right? Because you'll realize when you enter eternity, that wasn't the life worth living. Right? Because how you live in eternity is going to determine, uh, how you live now is going to determine what your life will be like, what your eternal life will be like. So wouldn't you rather live for the eternity rather than live for the now? So three types of Christians, fighting, watching, or sleeping. Which one are you? Right? And we all want to be in the fight. You know, it's like when Jesus talks about, you know, he looks on the harvest and he says there's not, a, there's, there's not enough people for the harvest. He's pray, the Lord of the harvest, that he'll send forth laborers into that harvest because there's a war going on and there's just not enough soldiers. So we need to heed that call, right? We can't expect somebody else to join the fight, right? Because who's going who's gonna to fight the fight in this area? That's going to be us. Right, so we need to get into the fight and we need to get out there and preach the gospel. All right? So Ephesians 6, this is a part of the chapter that I'm focusing on this morning. He says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. All right, so the devil and his minions, they don't rest. Right, so that's why we need to put in everything we've got, right, to fight this fight, right? And that doesn't always just mean like, you know, you know, going out soul winning every single day. It's just what I'm talking about is, you know, we go soul winning, but we also need to be an ambassador in our everyday life. You know, it's, think about the way you live, the way you talk, the way you communicate with people, your testimony out and about in your workplaces, in your businesses, and in your day to day life. That makes a difference as well. Put on the whole, whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So this is not a physical fight that we're in. 
but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So we are fighting a spiritual fight. So what does it mean by a spiritual fight? It means that it's a fight of words, isn't it? So that's why it's prayer and preaching we're going to see later on. Those are the ways that we attack and the way that we fight. But we also need this armour to protect us. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning as well. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. I always notice how often in these couple, these couple of verses here that the Bible just uses the word stand, stand, stand. You see that? Wherefore, take unto you the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So that's the passage that we're going to look at today. And we want to be able to stand. So the armour of God is going to help us stand. So when you think of that word stand, what does it mean? It means you're not moved, you're not swayed. So you're standing on the truth of God's word, you're standing for the truth of God's word, and you're not compromising, right? You're not being moved from that. You're not being moved back into your old ways. You know, sometimes when we get saved and we want to sort of start getting the sin out of our life, we want to make some changes in our life, we start moving forward. When you start moving forward, you want to sort of nail down where you are and keep moving forward and not be swayed backwards, right? And, and the armour of God is going to help you do that. So let's go through each of these uh, elements of the armour of God and explain to you why I think, why I believe each of them is described as what they are. And if you're sitting in kids club this morning would have got a sneak preview of what each of these mean and uh, maybe you've heard me preach on these before uh, you'll know what each of them represent so the first item in the armor of god is a belt right it's the belt of truth so stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth so your loins is like your belly area Bible talks about when uh, the pains in a, in, a, in a female, in her loins, you know, when she's about to give birth. So you think about your loins is like this belly area, right? So when you girt your loins about, people recognize this, this piece of equipment in the armor of God as the belt of truth. Now, why is truth represented by a belt? Now, my theory is, is because what does a belt do? A belt is the idea is it's to hold up your lower garment, isn't it? It's to hold your pants up and you have a belt and you, you gird your loins about with truth. So if you don't have a belt, what happens, right? It's like got nothing to hold your pants up, right? You can, so your nakedness is basically being revealed. So, so my theory is that the reason why truth is representative of a belt is because when your nakedness is revealed, obviously there's a lot of shame associated with nakedness. Now, unfortunately today, men and women don't get this idea that it's meant to be a shameful thing to reveal your nakedness. And then the way women dress these days is they, they try and dress in a way where you can basically see their nakedness, but not see it because it's just skin-tight clothing and whatnot. But the way that, w that women should dress should be in a way where it respects the fact that nakedness is meant to be a shameful thing and it's meant to be covered up. This is why modest apparel tends to not be super tight, usually a bit looser clothing is more modest. So when it comes to having a belt, the belt is the idea of it's covering your nakedness, right? What is nakedness? Exodus 28, 42. This is uh, the priest's garments in the Old Testament. Thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. From the loins, even unto the thighs, they shall reach. So it's obvious that your nakedness, you know, is where your reproductive organs are. That's part of your nakedness. But did you know something interesting? That, you know, breasts in the Bible are not actually considered nakedness. 
Now you say victim. It's not considered nakedness. Does that mean like women should just be able to walk around with topless and they're not necessarily sinning? No, because this is where modesty comes into play, right? So there's a, there's a principle in the Bible called modesty as well. And just because technically breasts are nakedness, that doesn't mean that they should necessarily be shown. But yeah, something interesting that you may not know about nakedness is that it, it is not technically a sin to see somebody's nakedness, right? So some people teach that it's a sin to see somebody's nakedness. Uh, it's not technically a sin because if it was a sin, that would mean, you know, you couldn't operate on somebody. You know, how can you operate on somebody if you can't see their nakedness um, and whatnot? So some people teach that it's a sin to reveal your nakedness, but we have to understand that revealing your nakedness is the idea of modesty, right? It's not that it's just in and of itself revealing your nakedness to sin because there are situations where you may need to, right? And uh, this is an interesting chapter in Isaiah, uh, chapter, tw uh, chapter 20. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this story of Isaiah. It's only six verses, and when you realise what it's about, maybe this is why it's only six verses. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder, did, did Isaiah not want to write too much about this? Uh, Isaiah chapter 20 says, In the year that Tartan came unto Ashdod, when Saga, Sargon, the king of Assyria, sent him and fought against Ashdod and took it, at the same time spake the Lord by Isaiah, to son, the son of Amos, saying, Go and loose the sackcloth from off thy loins and put off... So you remember we talked about the, the gird about your loins with truth? So he's loosing the sackcloth from off his loins. So now he's not girding, girding up his loins. Put off thy shoe from thy foot. And he did so, walking naked and barefoot. And the Lord said, Like as my servant Isaiah hath walked naked and barefoot, look at this, three years for a sign and wonder upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptians' prisoners and the Ethiopians' captives, young and old, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks uncovered. Right? So your nakedness is not only the front, Nakedness is the back as well. So that's why the idea is that this area should be covered. But that's why women, you ought not to wear things that just basically wrap themselves all the way up into your nakedness on the front and the back, where you basically may as well not be wearing anything, right? So this is what nakedness is. And they shall be afraid and ashamed of Ethiopia, their expectation, and of Egypt, their glory. And the inhabitant of this isle shall say in that day, Behold, such is our expectation. Whither we flee for help to be delivered from the king of Assyria, and how shall we escape? <laughs> so whenever I read that story in Isaiah 20, I always laugh because, you know, so what's basically happening here is God is commanding Isaiah to walk naked and barefoot. And he, asked, he commanded him to do it for three years, right? And the idea was it was a, a sign that this is the shame that, you know, God was going to bring on um, that nation as well. So the point is here, you know, you can see that it's not necessarily sinful to see somebody's nakedness. Otherwise, God couldn't command Isaiah to do this. But like I said, nakedness is meant to be a shameful thing. It's, not, it's, it's meant to be when you reveal it, you're bringing shame to yourself. And it's unfortunate that people these days do that willingly. Um, Revelation 3, look at this. So then, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. So this is the lukewarm church in Revelation 3. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing... And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Okay, so we're talking about the belt of truth. Now, so we know that a physical belt helps us to, you know, keep our pants up, helps us to keep our nakedness so we're not ashamed. So how does that relate to the spiritual, right? When the truth helps you to not be ashamed. Well, if you know your Bible, this, this verse may be familiar to you. 2 Timothy 2.15. Look at what it says here. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth, look at this, not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So you see, like in the spiritual realm, when you need to go out and you need to convince people of the truth, if you don't know the truth yourself, how are you going to defend the truth, right? And then you'll end up being ashamed, not knowing what you ought to know. I mean, imagine as, as a Christian, if somebody was to come up to you one day and say, hey, you know, I heard you're a Christian. I was looking about heaven and hell. I think this stuff is real. 
how do, how do I get to heaven? Can you imagine if somebody came up to you and asked you a question like that and you said, oh, I don't know, I just go to church. I just, I don't know how to explain these things. I mean, would you not feel ashamed that you, you had that opportunity to teach somebody how to go to heaven and you didn't even know how to explain it? This is what this is talking about. Hey, study to show yourself approved unto God. Right? No, don't study to show yourself approved unto others. You know, study to show yourself approved unto God. The reason why you ought to study the word of truth is because you care about what God thinks, not about what other people think. A workman, see, it's going to take some work to study, that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the truth. Why? Because if you're a Christian and you profess to be a Christian, and people know you're a Christian, and you don't know what you're talking about, you're going to bring shame, right, to not only yourself, but to the cause of Christ as well. Because if somebody wants to know about Jesus and you don't know how to explain it to them, that's a shameful thing. Second Timothy 3, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So, you know, you know the Bible. You can be a wise person. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Um, Elizabeth, do you want to just hit the uh, aircon? I think they've turned off. Just hit the two aircon buttons. It's the two ones on top. Psalm 19, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. All right, so the belt of truth. Now you understand why truth is representative of a belt, because it helps to hide your nakedness and so you're, that you're not ashamed. You need to know the truth, right? Put on the belt of truth. Number two is the breastplate of righteousness. Now why is righteousness representative of a breastplate. Ephesians 6, Stand therefore having your loins go about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. So think about the armour that is, you know, protecting your torso. Why is that righteousness? What is it protecting, first of all? Right? What's, a, what's a vital organ that's in this area? It's your heart, isn't it? So the reason why I believe that the breastplate of the, that righteousness is representative of a breastplate is because if you live a righteous life, what does that mean? It's a life where you're trying to get the sin out of your life, you're trying to do the right thing by God, trying to keep his commandments, that's going to keep your heart right. That's going to protect your heart from being allured to other things in this world. Look at what it says here in 1 John 2. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Right? Righteousness. Loving God. Right? Doing the will of God. That is going to protect your heart. That shows how you love God. And if you have the love of God in you, you have less of the love of the world in you. Right? So you see how that righteousness protects your heart. And love and keeping God's commandments are interlinked. Look what Jesus said in John 14, 15. If ye love me, keep my commandments. So you can't love God without keeping his commandments. You, know, you say, I love God so much. Oh man, he's, I just love him so much. But do you ever read his word? I love God so much. How do you feel about coming to church? Is it grievous to you? Or is it a joyful thing to you? You say, I love God. That's why I love coming to church. You say, I love God. Ah, oh, but I hate coming to church. And I love God. But I hate reading the Bible. I'm not a reading person. I love God, but oh, when I sing, I'm not a singing person. Right? See, if you love Jesus, you keep his commandments. Yeah, that's why if you love God, you'll do what God wants you to do. That's how you, that's how you prove your love. Love is not just a feeling. Right? Love is an action. Right? Love is something that you decide to do. Right? Are there feelings involved in love as well? Yes. But if you have a feeling for somebody, but you don't do what's right by them, do you really love them? Yeah, that's just, that's just vain, vain feelings, isn't it? Look what it says here in uh, Luke 6, 43. For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit. Neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. See, some people think that when in Matthew and in Luke, when the Bible talks about bringing forth fruit and having good fruit and bad fruit, they just think it always just refers to your works as a Christian, right? 
But I believe the, the fruit that it's referring to is the fruit of your mouth, right? The things that you say, right? And look at what it says here. It talks about the good tree bringing not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit, for every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of bramble bush gather they grapes. Verse 45, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. So what are these fruit, what is this fruit bringing forth from the tree? Is it necessarily the works that you have? No, it's the things that you're saying, right? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So you can see here that if you fill your heart with evil things, evil things are going to come out. If you fill your heart with good things, right, good things are going to come out. That's why righteousness is a breastplate, because it's protecting your heart. Right? Number three. Number three is the boots of the gospel. Ephesians 6, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, why is the gospel represented by boots in the armor of God? It's because when you need to go somewhere, you need to go on a journey, what do you do? You put your shoes on, don't you? You put sandals on, you put boots on, and this is the armor of God, so it's representative by boots. Why? Because the gospel is meant to be taken to the world. How many churches now, they, they invite people to their church, right? And they say, come, and when you come here, I'm going to preach the gospel to you. And unfortunately, when churches do that, what happens? You just get a gospel sermon every Sunday, rather than, you know, learning the Bible. There's many things to learn in the Bible. You know, some people have this mindset that, oh, when I go to church, I want to hear the gospel preached. That's not what church is for. Right? Church is not here to be, to be an outreach here. We go into all the world and preach the gospel. Then we bring them here and we want to teach them all the Bible. So yes, is there going to be some sermons about the gospel where you're learning about salvation, you're learning about eternal security? Yes. But there are other things you need to learn as well. You need to learn about parenting. You need to learn about end times. You need to learn about doctrine and other things like that. So there's a lot of things to learn. And that's what church is for. Church is for you to learn as believers. But imagine if you came to church every Sunday and all you heard was the gospel. And every Sunday, the gospel. The next week, the gospel. I mean, eventually you'd get bored, right? But when you go out and preach the gospel and you're going door to door, you're more than happy to preach the gospel at every door because these people haven't always heard of the gospel. They don't always understand the gospel. So when the gospel is representative of boots, why? Because we take the gospel to the unbeliever. We don't expect the unbeliever to come to us. This is why we don't just believe that, sal that, that the work of evangelism is just waiting for people to ask you, you're a Christian, how do I go to heaven? That's not the... Because you know what? 99 times or 999 times out of 1,000, that's not going to be the case. right? You know why? Because the unbelieving world, they are not seeking after God. It's God, God who seeks after them. And you know how God seeks after them? Through you. Right? Because when you go to seek and save the lost, that's God working through you to reach the lost out there, to reach those that are not saved. So this is why Mark 16, he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Matthew 28 says here, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Acts 1, look at this. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So you see how Jesus expects us to try and reach as many people as we can, right? Jerusalem. Judea, Samaria, unto the uttermost part of the earth. This is why people, they go and they start ministries in other countries to go and bring the gospel to them. Right? But some Christians have this idea that the people that they just come across in their life, because you know, God forbid that we would inconvenience ourselves to you know, try and do the work of God. Right? Some Christians have this idea that you know, well, I'm just only going to talk to people that come across my way. You know, either I'm sitting next to them on the bus, or I happen to go about my business and I run into other people. 
Do you get this idea from the Bible that that's all that God expects from us? God doesn't just expect from us to just do evangelism by convenience, right? He's commissioned the church to say, hey, this is the purpose of the church to go and preach the gospel to every creature, to baptize them, teach them things, you know, whatsoever I've commanded you. Do we get this idea that the church's job and us as believers is just to only talk to people about Jesus when it's convenient to us? No, this is why we, churches have outreach ministries. This is why we have soul winning, because part of our job is to go and reach people who would not come across us. right? Because you're not going to come across everybody in the Liverpool area. right? But what we can do is we can go to them. right? We can go to them and make sure that they have an opportunity to hear the gospel. right? Luke 14, the Lord said unto the servant, this was the, 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 the supper that was prepared, the great supper, he said, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Right? So don't get this idea that, you know, we, we're not trying to convince people. Sometimes people, you know, they, they, they think of it as a negative thing. And you can always describe things in a negative way or a positive way. You know, like when people say, ah, you know, you're pressuring me. I'm encouraging you. you know? I'm, not, I'm not being pushy. I'm not trying to be pushy. I'm trying to compel you. I'm trying to convince you. You know, It's like when people go to your eyes, it's like, oh, you shouldn't be trying to change people's minds. It's like, well, you know, well, we are, obviously. We're trying to change people's minds. We're trying to get them to think differently. Uh, we're trying to do it in a loving way. We're not trying to be obnoxious about it. But, you know, people just say things in a positive light or in a negative light. But ultimately, that's what we're doing. We're trying to compel people to come in that God's house may be filled. So we are going out of our way to talk to people that would not otherwise talk to us, hoping that they will give us an opportunity to explain to them and hoping that their minds will change. Right? First Peter 3.15. And why am I going to this passage? Because when we looked at the boots of the gospel, you see here it says here, your feet shod with the preparation of of the gospel of peace. Why is that? Because it takes some preparation for you to go out and explain to people. Right? And we, we ought to be prepared. When it says here in 1 Peter 3.15, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You know, so it is a command of God to read the Bible, to know the Bible. But here's a good reason why you ought to do that, right? Because you always want to be ready when somebody asks you a question about Christianity. They ask you a question about Jesus. They have an objection. I mean, you need to know the answers. You know what? Because we, how, effective, how effective are we going to be as an army? We're talking about we're in a fight here. And how effective are we as an army if only a handful of us know how to fight? Isn't that right? And if we're going on the battlefield, because you're on the battlefield whether you're sleeping or whether you're watching, you're, you're on there, right? This is not being very effective for the fight, right? And if we go out there as an army and you're sleeping, you're watching, you don't even know how to fight, how are you helping? You know, how are you going to help the cause? Oftentimes, you know, this is now, now, you know, in the army and now they want, you know, women in the army, you know, they're all trying to get their gender diversity, equality, <laughs> um, equal number of women in the army. It's not just who's actually an effective soldier. And you know that that's a detriment to the army because the more people that are weaker out there on the field, the more people they have to take care of. You know, the more people they have to carry back to safety. And all. So, you know, this is like this in the Christian life. Right? In the Christian life, we need people on the battlefield that can fight. You need to be ready always to give an answer. Well, how do you get ready to fight? Well, you put on the armor of God. You need to know how to use the weapon, the things that we're talking about now. Look what it says here. Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Now, why am I going to this? Well, because, like I said, you know, we need to be ready always to give an answer, right? 
And the reason why I like this uh, first and great commandment, it says that we need to worship the Lord with all our heart. So if you think about these different, different aspects of how we love God, it means that God is the first and foremost thing that we desire. Right? If we think about our heart and the things that we desire, we, that we love. Right? And with all our soul. How do you love God with your soul? Well, your soul is who you are as a person. So the way I see it is, when we love God with all our soul, we're not ashamed to identify as a Christian. We stand tall with God, right? And identify with Him. You know, sometimes people are ashamed to be a Christian. They want people to know that they're a Christian. They don't want to be made fun of or ridiculed. But people who stand tall, you know, and say, yes, I am a Christian, and they're willing to be identified as a Christian, um, they love God with all their soul because it's part of who they are, right? With all thy mind. What does that mean? That I think it, what it means is, you know, as Christians, we're not just all about emotion. You know, loving God is not just all about, oh, I just love him so much. I just have these great feelings for him, right? Which is part of it. But it's loving God also intellectually, right? When we're talking about, you know, knowing the truth, being a good fighter, having an answer always, Right? We love God with all our mind. It also means we need to think rationally about these things. Right? Christianity, and what I, you know, one thing I love about Christianity, it's not a, a religion where you just need to leave your brain at the door. Because there are some religions like that that don't make sense. And you're almost like leaving your brain at the door. Whereas Christianity is a religion where you can think things through. Things are logical. You can defend them. And that's why when the Bible says, Sanctify the Lord God in your heart, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We are able to do that. Right? With all thy mind and with all thy strength. Right? That's with your energy. Right? Your time and your labor, putting it in to serve God. Right? And that's not only with things to do with church, but it's also you know, doing your job like you're serving Jesus. You know, don't be a slacker at work. You know, be a good employee. That is part of the righteousness, right, that you put on as part of the breastplate of righteousness is being a good employee as well. All right, number four, the shield of faith. The shield of faith. So faith is likened to a shield in the armor of God. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now, when I talk about faith, some people believe, you know, some people have this idea but faith just means you just, be, just believe, you know, like in the movies. Just believe in yourself, just believe. You know, it's, it's a very nebulous term where it's just having faith just means you, be, you believe and you, you can achieve anything, you know, believe. That's not what faith is in the Bible, right? Faith in the, in the Bible is so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So it's just not the fact that you believe in something. It's that you have faith. Because you can have faith in the wrong thing, right? So when you have faith according to the Bible, it's faith in God's Word. So faith doesn't just mean, oh, I believe that God can do something for me and it's contrary to the will of God. I believe, you know, people say, well, yeah, but I have faith that God has this path for me and it's like leaving your family to marry somebody else. You know, or it's like, you know, God has this path for me. It's getting a job where you have to work on Sundays. You know, God has this path for me where... You know, think of something else where it's like, you know, you, people say God has this path for me, but it's like, you know, working in some place that's not that good, you know, or whatever. So, faith is when you have faith in God's word. What does that mean? Faith is you read God's word and then you know what God's word says and faith is I believe what God's word says. That's what faith is. Faith is not just believing whatever you want about God. Faith is believing God's word about God. Right? That's what real Christian faith is. Hebrews eleven twenty seven. Now, why is faith representative of a shield? Right? Because when you have faith in God's word, it can protect you from things. It protects you from spiritual attacks. Right? Look at what Moses says about Moses here. By faith, he forsook Egypt not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. So that's why faith is like a shield, because faith can, can protect you from spiritual attacks. What are spiritual attacks? Spiritual attacks are like discouragement. You know, maybe it's a thought where it discourages you, it gets you down. You know, maybe it's a, maybe it's a, you know, it's a thought where, you know, you think, ah, oh, you know, what's the point of 
you know, going to, going to church. You know, some people have that thought, you know, when they're not living right, you, know, you don't have the breastplate of righteousness on, and then you start getting these thoughts like, you know, what's the point of it all? You know, or you, you start getting thoughts like, you know, well, God, God doesn't love me anymore. God's done with me. You know, how can God use somebody like me? But the shield of faith protects you from discouragement from that because when you read God's word, you realize, no, God still does love you. God still can use you. No, it's not pointless, right? And that's why faith is like a shield because when you believe God's word, when you get those spiritual darts of the wicked, it protects you from it. So it might be discouragement. It might be false doctrine, believing the wrong thing. Maybe it's unanswered questions. Sometimes people, they get a bit stumbled in their faith. You know, there's an objection you can't answer. You're like, oh, you know, shakes your faith a bit in God's word. But when you have faith in God's word, faith in God's word says, you know what, I don't know the answer yet, but I'm going to go find out the answer because there will be an answer to this because God's word is God's word. It's truth. Right? That's faith in God's word. So it helps us to understand things that maybe we don't understand. Hebrews 11 verse 3, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which do appear. Like in our society and when I was growing up, the whole evolution versus creation debate was a big one. Right? Atheism was the prevailing thought and everyone thought that they were being rational when they were an atheist. But now we know as the Christian creation movement has risen and uh, people have been given answers and you know, scientific journals written from a creation point of view that now you can see that it's actually evolution and you know, atheism that doesn't make sense. Right? But it was having faith in God's word and knowing that God created the world that drove people to want to find those answers and to fight that fight, right? And to still stand tall as creation believers uh, in the face of adversity when, you know, everyone was trying to push atheism down our throats in public school uh, when we were growing up. Psalm 18, verse 30. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. See that shield of faith? Not just faith in yourself, not just faith in your idea of God, faith in God's word and the revealed God of the Bible as we read God's word. That's who we have faith in. So make sure that you don't get this world's idea of faith where it's just believing in anything, you know, just having faith, right? It's faith in God's word. His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. I love that. It's tested. It's proven. We can, we can prove all things and hold fast to that which is good, the Bible says. And he is a buckler. You see that shield? That's what a buckler is, if you didn't know. I assume that everyone knows what a buckler is. If you play games like, you know, army games, you'll know what a buckler is. It's like a little shield. It's usually, it's usually the first one that you get. It's like this like, little wooden one, but it's the first one in the game. He's a buckler to all those that trust in him. All right, number five, the helmet of salvation. All right, Ephesians 6, and take the helmet of salvation. Now, why is salvation a helmet? Now, one thing it thinks, I think of that, you know, a helmet protects your head, right? And usually, you know, if you get you know, shot in the head or hit in the head, that's generally a fatal blow, isn't it? So I feel like salvation, if you think of it that way, it protects you from this fatal blow. You will never go to hell if you believe on Jesus Christ, you've received eternal life, you have salvation, you will never be dealt a fatal blow. Right? You will never. It doesn't, matter, it doesn't matter how many fiery darts of the wicked hit you, you know, even if you get out of church and you, 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 know, you live a terrible life and you fail in terms of as a Christian, you will never die a spiritual death. Right? The helmet of salvation. You'll never be dealt a, 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 a fatal blow. But not only that, in terms of the helmet of salvation in terms of protecting yourself from the fatal blow. But if you think about the helmet protecting your, your head, I mean, that your, your brain represents your mind, doesn't it? Usually the Bible talks about the heart is you know, your emotions, you know, but your, your head is like your mind. And I feel like salvation is one of those things where you know, it, it helps to make you see things the right way. It gives you the right frame of mind. Look what it says here in 2 Timothy 1.6, Wherefore I put... Thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by putting by by the putting on of my hands. This is Paul talking about Timothy here. He says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Right? So when we get saved, God gives us this new creature, you know, born again, this 
new creature has a sound mind. We can be put on the helmet of salvation. We can have this sound mind. Look at this passage in 1 Corinthians 2. This is comparing the wisdom of the world with the wisdom of God. Right? Verse 9, But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Now what I'd like to point out about this verse is this verse is often used incorrectly. Right? And I think uh, a lot of people use this verse when they talk about like, what's prepared for us in heaven. Now, I think it can apply to that, that we don't know. You know, I've not seen or heard, nor into the heart of man, the things that we will get in heaven. But 1 Corinthians 2 um, is actually talking about the wisdom, right? And saying that there was not, people did not know these things. But it doesn't mean they still don't know these things. Why? Because in verse 10 it says, but God, so it says, I had not seen, so, so eyes not seen, ears not heard, not entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for them that love him. And it's not just talking about things in heaven, it's talking about the wisdom, right? Verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. So what does that mean? There are things that we know and things that we can understand because we are saved, right? Because we have the Spirit of God. And that's why I believe that salvation is representative of the helmet because there are things that we can understand about the wisdom of God that an unsaved person does not. Right? For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. So it's saying you in your carnal flesh cannot understand the things of God but when you have the Spirit of God in you, teaching you, right? And a Spirit that is born of the Spirit, now there are things that you can understand about the Word of God that you may not have been able to understand previously. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. So you don't, so you don't have to be like a Gnostic, Go searching for this unknown wisdom, this secret wisdom that nobody knows through, just like, oh, God, just reveal something to me. No, you just need to read the Word of God. The wisdom is there and the Holy Ghost will teach you, right? Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but that which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, right? So this is the, un this is the unregenerate, regen unregenerate man, right? This is the, the flesh, Right, which is the unsaved person. That's all they have. Right? But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. For he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known, look at this, the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. See there, the helmet of salvation. Number six. So that's why salvation is represented by helmet. Number six is the sword of the Spirit. Now, up until this point in the armor of God, everything has been defensive, hasn't it? Right? You have the girt about with truth, the, the preparation shot, feet shot with preparation of the gospel, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith. You notice how that they're all defensive. But let me ask you, can you, can you win a battle... If all you're doing is defending, I mean, I, I've taken some boxing lessons with John, right? And John's like, hey, here's some ways that you defend. But he's always telling me, but you, you, every time you defend, you've got to be ready to hit back. Because you can't just be there just taking hits all the time. You've got to throw some punches. And it's the same with the sword of the spirit. That's our offensive weapon. Our offensive weapon is the sword of the spirit. Now, some people don't read their Bible. Some people don't know their Bible. How effective are you going to be in this spiritual fight? if you go to battle without your weapon. All right, so you need a weapon to go into battle. What is the sword of the Spirit? Ephesians 6, 17. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. All right, that's our weapon. Because we're in a spiritual war, we need to know our spiritual weapon to be in that spiritual war, right? Hebrews 4. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, 
What is that saying? It's saying because the soul, the sword of the spirit is so sharp, it says it divides even the spiritual things. It divides between. It's interesting. It's, it divides between soul and spirit, because generally people understand that soul and spirit are so closely intertwined, but the word of God is able to separate, you know, between those things. And of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So we see here that the word of God is likened to a two-edged sword, right? The, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Because that's what spirit is. I know I say this a lot. I just don't want you guys to think that this, you know, the spirit only has to be like just this nebulous thing that nobody really understands how it works. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't a spiritual side that we can't see where supernatural things happen. But what I believe is the way that the spirit, our spirit and the spirit of God interfaces with the physical realm is through words. That's why you wonder, how do you know you're hearing the spirit of God? It's because you're hearing the word of God. How do you know something you know, is moved by the spirit of God? It's because it's moved by the word of God. The, the word of God and the spirit of God are synonymous. These are not two different things. So this is why when you think about somebody is filled with the Spirit, what does that mean? Does that mean they're just somebody that's just really energetic and just somebody that's really emotional about the things of God? No. When you're filled with the Spirit, it means you know the Bible. right? You've filled yourself with the Spirit of God and that manifests in the physical realm because you, you can quote the Bible. Like you know the Bible. It's within you. You've memorized it. This is how you know you're filled with the Spirit. Why is it when you get saved, you get saved by the Spirit of God? Because you hear the Word of God, you believe the Word of God. Now that Word of God dwells in you, right? As faith in that Word. So you see how it works together. So you don't always have to think that the Spirit is just in the supernatural realm, which it is as well. It operates, God operates within the physical realm as well. How does that work? Well, because we hear the Word of God. That's why it's so interesting that Jesus is referred to as the Word made flesh. And the Word is how God interacts with the physical realm. And then when he became flesh, what was it that became flesh? His Word. I just think it's just, I mean, you know, only God could, you know, write things like this, you know, just make it all fit together. Revelation 1. See the Word of God representative. This is a picture of Jesus Christ in Revelation. It said he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth, look at this, went a sharp, a two edged sword. His countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Jesus says here in John 6, 63, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John 3, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. But that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth. And this is how I understand the spirit. I think it's just such an interesting analogy. So the, the wind is being likened to the spirit of God, right? The wind bloweth where it listeth. This, this word is related to lust. This means the wind blows wherever it wants. Right? And thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the spirit. So you see how the, the, the spirit is likened to the wind where you can't see it, but you can hear it. And it's like the same when you see the spirit of God working in people's lives, you can't see it. But how do you know the spirit of God is working in people's lives? Because you hear it. You hear the word of God coming out of their mouth. You hear that they're getting more familiar with God's word. Start talking about God's word. That's where you can start seeing the word of God and the spirit of God working in that person's life. Right, because you, you don't you don't necessarily see it, it's because you hear it, right? And if it's in them, that will you know, ultimately change the outwardly as well. But why isn't it the other way around? Why isn't it that well? I could see them working in God's life, you know? Because sometimes you have somebody that looks the part, plays the part, you know. But then, do they actually believe the right thing? You know, do they actually speak God's word? Because sometimes people look religious, they look spiritual. But then when you start hearing what they believe and what they're talking about, that's when you can actually judge. Can I actually hear the Spirit working in that person's life? Right? Ephesians 5, we talked about being filled with the Spirit. Being not drunk with wine, so rather than being filled with alcohol, so 
intoxicated with alcohol. We're meant to be filled with the Spirit. Right? Uh, so that's the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The last one I want to talk about is the sword of God, the sword of the Spirit is our weapon. Right? But then how do we actually deal a blow with that weapon? Right? It's like putting on gloves, but then how do you actually throw a punch right, in the spiritual world? Well, this is where prayer and preaching come into play. And this is what we see at the end of Ephesians 6. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Right? So, so why is prayer such an effective thing? in the spiritual realm. Because when you pray for others and you pray for God to be with them, to strengthen them, to supply their needs, you know, this is obviously multiplying the effectiveness of the army, right? So we pray for others, not only for ourselves, but for others. And we can see here what Paul was asking people to pray for him for. He says, you pray for me and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of of the gospel, for which I am ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So we see we're praying for one another, and then the way we deal the blows is because we're preaching the word, right? If you never open your mouth and let people know about the gospel, you're also not in the fight. Like, can you imagine somebody who's prepped, ready to go? You've got the armor of God on, you're holding the sword of the spirit, but then you never move. Right? You never go into all the world. You never swing that sword. How do you swing the sword in the spiritual fight? It's when you preach the word of God. Right? And preaching is not just what you're seeing here. This is public speaking. Right? Public speaking is when you're speaking to a crowd, you may be more speaking more dynamically, speaking more charismatically. That's, that's not all preaching is. Preaching can be... You know, you sit down with somebody on the next to the bus or you knock on somebody's door and you have a conversation with them. Every time you share a Bible verse with them or you say, this is what God's word, you quote God's word, that's you preaching, right? That's you in the spiritual fight. And what Paul is saying here, I mean, can you, can you imagine? You know, this is why, you, you know, when I read things like this from Paul, it just shows that Paul was just like any of us. You know, he probably had fears I mean, he had, he, he, if anyone, you know, could, could say that they had fears of preaching the gospel, it would be Paul, right? I mean, he's beaten, 39 stripes, say one, in prison, shipwrecked, you know, fast things often, you know, when he talks about all the things he went through. And, you know, we struggle to have boldness. We have fear. You know, when we compare what uh, people have gone through before us, I mean, we have really no excuses to be fearful. Um, he says here, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me. So even Paul himself was asking others to pray for him, saying that I would preach the gospel, preach the word of God boldly, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Right? So he knows this is how he should speak, but he's praying for people to help him with that. So we know that preaching the gospel... It's a duty of every Christian, 1 Corinthians 9. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing, nothing to glory of. So I can't boast in the fact that I'm doing this thing for God. Why? Because but necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against, but if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. <laughs> you know what he's saying there? You don't understand what he's saying. He's saying there, woe well unto me if I preach not the gospel. And he's saying this, if I do it willingly, then I'll get rewarded. But if I don't do it willingly, I'm still commanded to do it anyway. You're just going to lose your reward, right? <laughs> so if you don't do it with the right mindset, right? You're still commanded to do it, even with the wrong mindset against your will. But if you do it willingly, then you have a reward as well. So that's what Paul is saying there. The last thing I just want to talk about here is in Acts 4, where... You know, Paul talks about preaching boldly, speaking boldly. And I wanted to share this passage with you that, you know, where does boldness come from? Does it have to be a supernatural boldness? You know, where does, why are people more bold than others? 
Well, look at what it says here in Acts 4, verse 8. It says here, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, If we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. So you remember in Acts 4, they healed a person, right? And now they've been called in to answer by what power they healed this person. And he's saying, it's by Jesus Christ. And now he's saying how the Jews have rejected him. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now verse 13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. So the point I'm making here is, you say, yeah, but I'm not very bold in sharing the gospel, in talking about the Bible. But why is that? Because boldness is not just some supernatural thing that just overcomes you and you have boldness. Boldness can also come from how much time you've spent with Jesus. Now, what does that mean? Remember, Jesus, it's not just, you know, we, we don't want Christianity to just be an emotional experience, right? Like they do in some denominations. Spending time with Jesus is not just there just thinking about how great he is. And I'm not saying these things are necessarily bad. I'm just saying this is not the extent of your relationship with God, right? That you just think about him, think about how great he is. Because remember, Jesus, who is he? He's the word of God, right? And you can't separate that from the written word of God. So when you spend time with Jesus, what does that actually mean? What that actually means is you're reading God's word. When you're reading God's word, you're spending time in God's word. The more you know God's word, you know what? The more boldly you're going to speak about God's word. Right? Because you know it. And that's why I find this passage always really interesting. That they thought, hey, these guys were unlearned men. They're not you know, the scholarly, not Pharisees and scribes, but they marveled and took knowledge of them. They realised that these men spoke boldly and they knew what they were talking about and they said, look, they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Do people, that, do, do people get that idea about you? Do people get that idea about you? When you talk about Christianity, when you talk about, about the gospel, do they get this impression that this person knows their Bible. You know, man, this person, they, 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 they know their Bible, man. They're like quoting verses, they're explaining things. That's how you want people to think about you, right? And that's how you know you're being an effective soldier. Because then when you speak from the Bible, you speak with authority, not because you have authority, because you know what you're talking about, because your authority comes from the Bible. <laughs> and they'll take knowledge that you've been with Jesus. All right, so in closing... I hope this uh, sermon was encouraging to you, you know, exhorted you, hopefully goaded you a bit. Yeah? Do you realise that we are in a spiritual fight? Do you realise we are in a spiritual fight? How are you helping the spiritual fight? What sort of Christian are you? Are you fighting? Are you just watching? Or are you asleep? Are you asleep in this fight? Are you a soldier in this spiritual fight? Do you have the full armour on? When we think about the armour, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, right? your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, right? the sword of the spirit. You know, do you have the full armour on? Which armour are you lacking? Right? That you need to strengthen up, make sure you're wearing it. And when we think about the weapon that we have, Right? Are you skilled in using the weapon? You know, it's like, a, it's like having a gun. You know, you don't just want to give somebody that has no idea, you know, a gun. Because you know what? Because if you're, and I just had this thought just now. Because you know what? If you have a weapon and you're unskilled with it, you know what you'll do? You can do a lot of damage, not to yourself, but to others as well, around you. 
Imagine, like, think about friendly fire in a war. Like, you have no idea. It's just like, you could end up shooting your teammate. You know? So we want to be skillful with the Word of God because if we are not skillful with the Word of God, that's why sometimes you can turn people away from the Gospel. You can offend people to the point where they don't even want to hear about the Bible. And it's not, it's not, you know, we want to make sure, you know, this is the mindset you want to have when you're preaching the gospel and you're talking about anything to do with truth, right? You want people, if somebody's going to get offended, make sure they get offended at the position, right? Meaning the, the position that you take, not your disposition, that's what they say. Make sure people, you know, that they're not offended by your disposition. They're offended by your position. What does that mean? They're offended because they don't like the truth you're sharing with them. They're not offended because of the way you're sharing that truth. The way you're telling it to them. And this is how you can skillfully, you know, because we all have the Bible, right? Now I can use the Bible skillfully or use it unskillfully. And that may be the difference between how effective I am at preaching the gospel. So are you skilled with your weapon? All right, so I hope you learned something there today. Uh, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you that you provide us with the truth. Uh, Lord, help us to be a uh, effective soldier. Lord, help us to be Christians that are in the fight. Help us to, uh, Lord, uh, put uh, souls on our, on our vision. And uh, Lord, I pray that you will help us to be effective witnesses for you. Um, thank you, Lord. Thank you that you give us this direction of how we can protect ourselves in this spiritual fight, put on the whole armor of God. And I pray, Lord, that uh, this sermon will encourage your people here today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.